Hello, good evening. I, I realize I'm the only obstacle between you and the dinner. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, at this meeting. Uh, I feel quite honored. I, I'm, come, I'm just a humble astronomer coming to this uh, community of uh, nuclear physicists and particle physicists. Now, it turns out to be a very special day in physics and astronomy. So at 4 p.m. Uh, this afternoon, just a couple of hours ago, there was the official announcement of the gravitational wave uh, event. Um, I listened to some of it, watching some of my colleagues, and uh, I thought I'll spare only one slide on that. Uh, if there are questions in the end, uh, we, can, we can talk about it. Uh, I should say I'm not a part of LIGO or Virgo, but I'm part of the dark energy survey, which happens to have a nice camera that observed a, an optical appearance. So for those who haven't followed what happened because there was an embargo until 4 o'clock, in fact, I, I did not even allow myself to, to load the, the presentation because I thought it's so, such a secret, right? Uh, so what, essentially what happened in, uh, on, in August the 17th, the LIGO uh, plus Virgo, uh, which is here in Italy, right? Uh, detected uh, yet another signal of gravitational waves. The previous four were all mergers of two black holes. And this was different as a merger of two neutron stars. Now, the exciting thing here is that with black holes, when they collide, because they live just they're in a vacuum, at least the textbooks say that there will be no electromagnetic radiation. And in fact, nothing was found. It doesn't mean that it cannot happen but nothing was found. With this one, the textbooks tell us that there would be uh, electromagnetic radiation, and indeed, that's what has been found. So what happened here is that uh, 70 observatories were involved, and uh, half a dozen or so actually detected it, and this is the picture from uh, uh, the dark energy camera, which, which, in fact, I'll talk about later in the context of neutrino mass, believe it or not, uh, and um, so it turns out that the event, the gravitational wave event, uh, happened in a galaxy relatively nearby called, oh, sorry, called uh, NGC 4993. It's uh, 40 megaparsecs away. So the event happened about 130 million years ago. And um, within half a day or so, uh, among the other half a dozen or so observatories, uh, our project uh, discovered that uh, extra light there, this flash of light. And after two weeks or so, it has faded away. If we go from that picture to the light curve, so this is light against, or flux, log flux against time, you can see the decline of the light in different uh, bands, uh, and that's uh, associated with what's called the kilonova. Uh, so it's all very exciting. I mean, you can go to the, in fact, this paper led by uh, a colleague, uh, Suarez, uh, Marcel Suarez Santos, has just appeared. If you go to the DES website, you can see this and several other papers. Uh, we are doing some more in my own group with uh, PhD student, uh, Antonella Palmassi, in fact, an Italian, uh, and, and the postdoc, Will Hartley, but uh, they said on the press conference that on one of the papers there are 3,500 authors. So I think we are now really competing with particle physics, right? Uh, so that's really, in a nutshell, there's a lot on the LIGO website and in the news, and it's a big thing. But uh, I have to switch now to neutrino mass, otherwise, uh, you know, you'll ask for the money back. So I have to switch to neutrino mass. So uh, uh, let's see. So that topic is neutrino mass from cosmological surveys. Everything else we heard today has to do with uh, clever experiments you're all involved in. Uh, so I come from, from the astronomy side of things. and. Uh, Essentially, uh, what we're, I'll talk a little bit about the history of hot dark matter, that's how it was known in the early days, 
uh, about how the, we improve the upper limit on the neutrino mass by about a factor of 10 in 15 years, but still no detection of the sum of neutrino mass. Uh, but I think we are nearly there. And then a bit of forecast to the future, how to control systematics, how to do things a bit differently, and maybe how to let the terrestrial experiments and cosmological experiments to talk to each other. Um, so these are the big questions. In fact, we had very similar questions on the slides in the opening talk and uh, the one that followed. Uh, I think I'm talking here to really the experts, but we still don't know the absolute sum of neutrino mass, although from the oscillations in some modeling, the lower limit is 0.06 EV. I'll come back to that magic number later. Uh, what's the hierarchy, normal or inverted? Is N effective 3.045, which is what the theory predicts? Uh, or larger, is there dark radiation in the form of uh, extra neutrinos, uh, sterile and the like? And, and is the neutrino its antiparticle? So uh, just a bit of history, because I find it also fascinating how ideas change over, over time. So in the 1970s, uh, the Russian or Soviet school of cosmology at the time, led by Zeldovich, actually liked the idea that dark matter is made of hot, is made of massive neutrinos. And uh, in his model, what you'd get are so-called Zeldovich pancakes. So the massive neutrinos would wipe out structure on small scales, you'd leave it the big things, and then would fragment. So this was the model, which now is not believed to be correct because the neutrino mass is not as big. Uh, the, so problem is structure formation. Then there was this even some discussion about mixed cold dark matter and hot dark matter. And now, for quite a while, we have this uh, uh, win winner so far of a universe made of 4% uh, baryons, 26% cold dark matter, and 70% dark energy which seems really to agree you know, with most observations, including our last study from Dark Energy Survey from August. Uh, I think it's an interesting remark to make that, that maybe, uh, maybe it was good during the Cold War that the two schools of thought did not talk to each other. So they had different views, bottom up and top down. And actually, the truth is somewhere in between. Now, there's probably called dark matter. We don't know what it is. And there is also dark matter. There is neutrinos. In fact, it's the only thing we know exists. So Zeldovich was also right. So everyone was right. And I think it's good maybe to have different groups thinking differently. Now, so what, what happens here, I alluded to it with, with Zeldovich pancakes, is it's kind of uh, thinking this little neutrino, which you are trying to capture, <laughs> In, in your experiments, what it does, it wipes out structure, right? And, and all we're trying to do is, from the universe we observe, these are real data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. You can see a big wall here, and you can see this is 2DF, a survey which went for 10 years. I was a member of that team as well, uh, which had, again, those walls here. And it's just a universe with or without massive neutrinos would look a bit differently. So the more massive neutrinos you have, the more things will get wiped out. Uh, the less you have, the more blobby the, universe, the, the distribution is. Okay, that's the, that's the, 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 and this is an example from a simulation. So here, you know, they put just for the sake of uh, illustration, something with dark matter with almost two EV neutrinos, and you see structure is washed out. If zero neutrino mass, you see that it's a very sharp image of the same structure, right? So that's what neutrinos do. Uh, and this is the physics here that they, they, when they were still relativistic and they wiped out structure on small scales. And this is this kind of equation. I like this one. It connects the macro to the micro. So big M is the sum of M1 plus M2 plus M3. And omega nu is the density uh, normalized density of neutrino mass, and H is the Hubble constant squared, right? So here is your small number from particle physics connected to the overall one in terms of omega. Um, so this, I think, I don't need to show to this audience, but it's more to remind to myself that we still don't know if it's inverted or uh, normal. 
Uh, and then, but this is important because this translates into, I'm sorry, it's a bit faint, but this translates into this part, type of diagram that if you put the sum, this is M1 plus M2 plus M3, against the lightest neutrino, you can see that with the current uh, oscillations data, you can have different lines here, depending on the hierarchy that's inverted in blue and normal in green. And over there, you see it's degenerate. You cannot tell if the lightest one is, is relatively heavy, you cannot tell one from the other. But imagine it's much smaller, then you can start tell one from the other. And if you read it that way, because the cosmology constrains the sum, M1 plus M2 plus M3, then it depends where we are, right? If it's there or there, if the future will be there, we can actually tell from cosmology even the hierarchy. Okay, so it's not just, it depends how you read this diagram, yeah? On the left, you can see the effect. So this is the, oh, sorry. This is the power spectrum of fluctuations, P of K. These are the Fourier, it's a Fourier transform of the density field, right? So just to make sure it's all understood, here is a density field. I take Fourier transform of it in three dimensions, and this gives me the delta squared in, in K space are these uh, fluctuations. Now, I can divide it by a power spectrum or the difference by power spectrum without, without any neutrino. So this will be a straight line. And the more the massive the neutrinos are, so here we have, for example, the sum M1 plus M2 plus M3, 50 MeV, or 0.05, you see a depletion, right? You see a depletion. So that's what we're trying to do in cosmology. We take the survey, we do a big survey, we uh, take Fourier transform, and we see whether there's a decrement. But of course, when you're trying to find a decrement, it is relative to what? So it depends where you normalize it. And also depends what's your dynamical range. And then there are many other systematics. So that's why it's not so easy. But I think we are already in that range, more or less, uh, as I'll show in a moment. OK, are you with me with this? OK, just on the top here, Again, it's, it's a bit too bright, but it shows how different probes pro look at different scales. K is the, the wave number. So we have the CMB, galaxies, weak lensing, Lyman alpha clouds. So we have multiple probes, and they look at different scales. And we're trying to combine them, which is also a bit tricky, because if you combine things which are not quite right, you can also introduce a tilt. So you have to be very careful with that. OK, so this is just an example we did uh, some years ago. I show it deliberately to show that numbers have not changed that much, for better or worse. So this is a survey of galaxies, of 700,000 galaxies. And we found that if you do this exercise, you get an upper limit of 0.28 EV. So it's, again, M1 plus M2 plus M3. And from the, oscilla from the oscillation, sorry, uh, the minimal case is 0.06. So we're somewhere there. Interesting enough, with Planck, with all the achievements of Planck, the upper limit is not so different. It's not so different. I'll show a more detailed table in a moment. So the number to take home is that uh, we are more or less kind of, if you like to be a bit conservative, it's, well, depends. Let's call it 0.2 EV is our upper limit. The important thing to emphasize that if you tell us it's 0.06 from the bottom, and that's point two. At some point, very soon, we have to find it, right? So I think it's a very exciting period. Uh, this is then the Planck result, which I already alluded to, so 0.23 EV, or if you like it, omega nu h squared, 0.0025. Uh, and this is the number of effective neutrinos. I'll show a more detailed uh, table of that. So you see, the plots, unfortunately, only show upper limits. We hope one day to have some detection, right? This is the, the hope. Uh, now, some few, I'll speed up, uh, a few health uh, warnings here. I think it's good to remember what we goes into it, not just a number to take home, that everything is done within a cosmological, oops, have I lost it? Yeah, let's see. Everything is done, sorry. Everything is done within a cosmological model, right? It's not just you get the neutrino mass for free. It's all, you have to buy the whole package. So you have to believe there's called dark matter and lambda, 
uh, which you may normally not like, but that comes into it because that's your, when you solve Boltzmann's equation, you have to put all the ingredients in the machinery. Um, the, some probes are more sensitive to it more directly. Other probes indirectly constrain the other parameters, right? So it could be that you constrain, for example, omega matter by a different technique. It helps you to tell omega neutrino. So it's indirect. And uh, the selection of best data sets is somewhat subjective. We have to confess that. People decide which data to take. And uh, there is a mismatch of data set could lead to spurious new physics. So I'm deliberately not trying to oversell cosmology to you. I'm telling you what, what you have to be careful about. OK, so this is just the first interesting number is n effective. So that's the number of neutrino uh, species. And the theory uh, is, well, 3 is the number, but you have this 0.045, which is the correction. I mean, you know how to derive it. There's some correction there. Uh, and that's what the data actually shows. OK, CMB alone, CMB plus probes of background evolution and probes of background evolution plus last case structure. I think if you want a short summary for this time of the day, it's almost all of them are consistent with, with that number, OK? So this is, uh, incidentally, 68%. Of course, you can look to some extremes, 3.4 plus minus 0 02, things like that. But I would say it looks actually remarkably well. I'm, it's actually impressive that, that it, it, this is robust. The hardest part, which I already mentioned, is the neutrino mass. Here, I quote 95%, not 68%, because it's an upper limit. And I want just to show you, this is a study we did with 2DF 15 years ago. So we're very proud that we got 1.8 EV at the time. And then that's another stu study I showed 2010. This is from our group, 28 EV. But then, of course, there all these other groups, of course, Planck in particular, 0.23 EV. And uh, the Dark Energy Survey, which is our new survey, this is the results that appear in August, gave 0.29 EV. Uh, if you want to be a bit more adventurous, use Lyman Alpha clouds. And they tell us that they get 0.12 EV. So they are the winners. But then you have to talk to them and understand all kinds of selection effects and feedbacks and so on. The physics is not uh, completely clean, right? But that's the number. So, you know, usually when I talk to people in the corridor over coffee, I say 0.2 EV. Someone stopped me the other day. The corridor, a mathematician said, what's the upper limit of 0.2? But you, know, you, can, you can look at these numbers and the longer tables of that. Uh, more, more interesting, of course, and I'm, I'm speeding up, uh, is, is what would happen in the future. So now we have what the funding agencies in the US call stage three projects. They are kind of coming to fruition like Dark Energy Survey. Uh, and uh, now there's a whole new generation. You can see Euclid, which is an ESA satellite, LSST, which is ground-based. Uh, again, those two, well, Euclid does also spectroscopy and imaging, LST imaging. DESI, not to be confused with DES, is a spectroscopic uh, survey, and SK is a radio survey. A, a number to take home is that it looks as if the sensitivity is going to be about, let's call it 0.05 EV. So this is becoming extremely interesting, because if the lower limit is 0.06, and this is so 0.05, well, something has to happen. If we don't see it, then maybe something else is wrong. So I think the next five, 10 years are going to be very exciting. OK. And then, of course, there's a the question of systematics. So why would I trust that? Uh, Galaxies tell me the mass, the, the matter distribution, right? They could be biased. So this is an, an approach we've taken uh, to actually take a sample of red galaxies and blue galaxies and see do they get the same answer. If they don't give the same answer, at least one of them is not a, a faithful tracer. If they give the same answer, you can maybe make a case that it's, it's stable. So, you know, things agree to within. This is, again, this power spectrum. It's, sorry, it's not very clear. It's the Fourier modes against K number. And this is red, blue, and all. And it's kind of one sigma away from each other. So it makes me feel a bit better that these methods are reliable. 
Uh, and now, very quickly, the dark energy survey. So this is a survey. Uh, I've been involved from, in it from the early days. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, it's, it's a big collaboration. There are now 400 people there from seven countries. It's led by Fermilab. And at UCL, uh, we participated in both the instrumentation, so part of this camera was actually assembled at UCL, and we also played leadership roles in the collaboration. I was the culture of science committee for many years. Uh, and it does many different things, cluster counts, weak lensing, large-scale structure supernovae. Uh, it will measure eventually about 300 million galaxies and thousands of supernovae. And we are now actually doing the fifth season of the observation, and it's probably the last one. We might get some extension, probably the last one. Or, although occasionally we get distracted by requests to look at gravitational wave events. So that's what happens. The moment there is an alert, you have to look at that. I was actually at the telescope, and there was an alert. And it turns out this was the first, the first black hole case. But we couldn't observe because there was an earthquake of 8.3. So I experienced gravity in a different way that night. Uh, and uh, it's already, you know, there are 120 or so papers on the archive, including what just appeared today, uh, uh, several papers that came in connection with the binary neutron star event. Uh, this is also, for those of you who have never seen dark matter, here is dark matter. So that's a map you get from weak lensing reconstruction. So galac distant galaxies get distorted by the intervening mass. It's a very tricky exercise. Uh, and then you do a reconstruction. So everything in between you and the sources generates a distortion in trying to see. Uh, although part of it is noise, I have to say, but we believe this is a real signal because if you look at the correlation, it, it makes sense, and you can use that also to define neutrino mass. So uh, this is kind of an interesting plot from the papers we had uh, in August. So it's on the archive. And these are two figures, 15 and 16, from that paper. And uh, well, time is short now. But uh, maybe I should kind of just explain uh, that this is uh, omega neutrino, sorry, omega matter. And that's the neutrino mass. And what you can see here, this is a big question in the community. If you do the analysis, should you? fix the neutrino mass to be 0.06 eV? Or should you allow it to float? And for example, if you do Planck with the 0.06 eV, it looks like that, the narrow one. If you don't, it's quite broad. And the same with dark energy survey. If you allow it to float, it's big. If you fix it, 0.06. So you know, to fix or not to fix, this is the question, right? <laughs> do you put it there? So there's this debate how to do things. Uh, and that's another plot, which I don't have quite time to explain. But this gives, essentially, this gives, a, 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 I just remind you, this gives an upper limit of, this exercise gives an upper limit of 0.29 EV. So it's not so much improvement relative to previous work, but it's nice to do it in a different way. OK. And finally, this is the future, where I said we'll go towards the 0.05 EV. So this is the experiments I mentioned, DESI and uh, LSST and Euclid. Uh, lots of things going to happen. This is DESI, uh, which is spectroscopic. So you will have 35 million uh, galaxy retreats, which is about 10 times what we have now. And that, now we come to this. Um, you know, you can show it to an undergraduate and make the undergraduate to decide whether they want to be an astronomer or particle physicist. I don't know which one is more exciting from this picture. Uh, but here there are, here is an earthquake occasionally, and here is, uh, I know you have to go through the streets in Germany, right? Uh, uh, what I would like to say, however, is that um, there is another emerging area. So this is in the, in, in the spirit of what I said, to fix or not to fix, 0.06 EV. There's a question, should you just have the particle physicists do their experiment and just do that, and astronomers do that, their experiment? Or should you try to combine them straight away in a kind of Bayesian framework? And we had an attempt uh, years ago, it's 10 years now, we did Katrin plus Planck plus Dark Energy Survey kind of feasibility study, 
these are papers by other groups which just appeared in May. Uh, and what, what they have done is some global base analysis uh, using double beta decay and neutrino oscillations and cosmology all in the same framework. So they have three likelihood functions and they multiply them and they put. Uh, so, so what is shown here is, is the mass from the uh, double beta decay against the um, sum M1 plus M2 plus M3. And that's the uh, in, 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 in two hierarchies, right? This is normal and that's inverted. So I think there's a scope there. In fact, at UCL, we are discussing it with each other, including here with Ruben uh, Sakyan, who is here. We, we talk about these different possibilities to bring uh, this data together. I think it's an interesting area. And that's a summary that the uh, number to take home is the current uh, upper limits are about 0.2 EV. Uh, and the future will hopefully re reach down to the 0.06, hopefully towards a measurement. Uh, understanding systematics is absolutely crucial, and uh, but I think it's going to be an interesting decade. And I'll stop here. Thank you for listening. Let's thank Professor Lahav.